Hi, mein Name ist Robert Wichert, ich bin Security Researcher bei Geetata, das ist eine Antivirusfirma hier in Bochum, für die uns noch nicht wissen. Wir sponsern seit ein paar Jahren den, das Hacker-Praktikum, das heißt im Endeffekt bieten wir einen zusätzlichen Abendevent an, wo wir euch alle und auch den Speaker einladen, bei uns in die Academy zu kommen. Um 18 Uhr sind die Türen offen, es gibt umsonst Essen, Trinken, Essen ist so gegen 19 Uhr fertig. Wer Lust hat, ist gerne eingeladen, darf man ja. Dann äh, übergebe ich das Wort an Hannes. Das war's auch schon. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, uh, I have to switch to English. Um, my name is Johannes Daser and uh, today I'm talking about uh, static code analysis and how we can detect vulnerabilities in modern PHP applications. Uh, modern in this case means we are not interested in toy applications but uh, like uh, recent versions of WordPress, uh, Joomla and the like. Uh, and uh, we will see how we can analyze this source code and detect vulnerabilities in it. Uh, so Shortly about me, why I'm standing here. Um, my name is Johannes, as I said. Uh, maybe some of you guys know me from the Flux Fingers team uh, or from my blog. And I studied, as you guys, IT security at the Ruhr University Bochum here. And to be honest, I wasn't always satisfied with my studies. So I struggled a lot with uh, signal theory and uh, circuit uh, theory stuff. Uh, you all have to go through as well, I guess. Uh, so yeah, as you can see by the numbers, I took a bit longer than the usual case, but anyway. Uh, so what kept me surviving during my studies was uh, playing Capture the Flag contests. Uh, you probably heard about the uh, Capture the Flag contests in the Hacker Practicum lessons. Uh, so you get some services, you have to analyze the source code, detect vulnerabilities, exploit them, and then you get points for it. <coughs> and uh, that was awesome. That was why I wanted to study further and that what was what kept me uh, st still studying IT security. So um, we founded the team in 2007 and um, started playing capture the flag contests and we sucked uh, a lot at the beginning. <laughs> uh, but then we, we learned a lot of stuff, especially about web application security. So we founded the Hacker Practicum in 2009 um, and this is where we are. It's, it's great that it's still so active and uh, got uh, so big. Uh, it just, it's, it's really nice to see. So on this point, thank you for uh, Nico, uh, who, who took over in 2011, I think, and developed and uh, it further. And um, also to Nikolai as well, of course. Uh, so um, next to the Capture Flag contest, I started working as a penetration tester and I did some professional code auditing. And um, soon then I realized, okay, actually I'm doing all the day the same stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm analyzing source code uh, and I'm always following the same concept, so why not automate that? And I started in 2007 writing some regular expressions and they fa failed miserably. Um, but in 2009 I released a more advanced type of aesthetic code analyzer that a uh, bit tokenized the source code and we will see parts of that later. Uh, but then Again, it was a mess and I rewrote it in 2012 and that's what I'm still doing until today. So I'm developing a prototype that tries to detect um, vulnerabilities in PHP code by static code analysis. Uh, so that's what I'm doing uh, as, as part of my research as a PhD student uh, at the systems uh, security uh, chair. Okay, why, why PHP? PHP always has, um, like it, it, it comes with some, some bad, with a bad taste. Uh, for me, the, um, the initial motivation was that in the CDF challenges we played 19% uh, or it was one of the top most common uh, languages during Capture the Flag contest. So that is why I started with PHP. Um, but still today, um, we have like 82% of all websites run PHP. We have the most popular open source uh, content management systems written in PHP, such as WordPress and Joomla. Uh, WordPress is run, according to some statistics, on 23% of all websites, which is a lot. So if you gain availability in WordPress, uh, you could possibly own 23% of all websites on the internet, which is a huge impact. And um, PHP has all those nasty little tricks and bugs uh, you probably learned during the Hackpra lessons. Um, so it's, it's, it's still an interesting target. 
So the concept I was talking about when I'm constantly looking in source code for vulnerabilities, or you guys are looking for vulnerabilities in source code, um, is that you have a source, and that source flows, literally speaking, into a sensitive sync. A sensitive sync is an operation in PHP that is somehow security critical. Um, so for example, we have the MySQL SQL, um, uh, the MySQL query function, and you, you go through the source code, you detect the SQL queries executed, so you see what kind of markup is surrounded, the SQL uh, markup, and uh, there is some source concatenated into this markup, then we have a SQL injection, and the same for cross head scripting. You have some cross head scripting things, such as print or echo, um, you analyze is the HTML code that is flowing into the sync, is it concatenated with some user input? And if so, then uh, you have a vulnerability. So that's our general concept of Tain style vulnerabilities. And if we have a concept we can follow manually, then we also can automate this concept. So you always have a source, it flows into a sync, and it gives you vulnerability types. Uh, for example, the first three ones, I guess you already learned about in the hacker practicum, and uh, the other two, the code execution, command execution, will follow up uh, after my talk. And interesting to note here is the logical flaws uh, cannot be detected in such a general manner. So you had, uh, I think, a business logical flaw where you could um, s um, change the amount for money you could get, you could buy some stuff in the bad bank. And these bugs don't follow a general concept, so they are really hard to detect statically. So I as I said, I, I wrote a first, a first version of, uh, of, a, of a tool, and uh, you can download it. It's open source, uh, and it will. Oh wait, something went wrong. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, you have to include the subdirectories. Um, it will scan the files and uh, detect some vulnerabilities. So I ran it on the bad bank code. And, oh wait, I, I made another mistake, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not on purpose, I'm sorry. Um, I have to include cross-head scripting as well. So, and uh, if we go through the analysis results, uh, we can already identify weaknesses of my first version. Um, so, we, we found a file inclusion vulnerability of, of last week or, or two weeks ago. Uh, where some replacement. Uh, that's the old BadBank code I wrote back in the days. I think maybe the code changed over the while, I guess. But um, And we found a SQL injection you guys exploited. If, if, if it was differently, then I'm sorry. Um, so we had here the SQL injection, and um, it detected some sanitization here, and here you had the source uh, flowing into this query again. But if you have a look at some other results, mainly here, there is a false positive. So it detected a SQL injection, although there is not a SQL injection in the bad bank. Mm. Um, and to put an example, uh, we have a look at the cross site scripting issues. Uh, probably some of you guys try to exploit the search functionality of the bad bank, where you can uh, search for stuff on a bad bank and you try it for cross site scripting. But it wasn't possible because one of those opening uh, braces was, was filtered. And the old version of the scanner does not detect that. And on the other hand, there's a cross site scripting vulnerability uh, where HTML entities was used um, together with uh, in the markup that used single quotes, if you remember. Was it, it, was it still present in the recent bad bank version? Okay. Uh, anyway, in the old bad bank version, there's still a vulnerability that the old scanner misses. And we have to be honest, the bad bank code isn't really complex, so that wouldn't be like a modern PHP application. So the first version, as you see, is quite fast, but uh, it, it has some issues. And actually, uh, what I did is just tokenize the code. So I split the code into tokens and loops through tokens a bit, but I don't really do uh, a comprehensive analysis. So I don't build a program model and analyze it, and we will see that concept later on. Um, so if we look at the, at the previous version, at the concept I followed, um, we noticed that I forgot something uh, in, this, in this model, which is uh, the sanitization. So developers in modern applications, they sanitize their data, so they put some filtering functions uh, in between the source and the sink, and that should prevent exploitation. 
And that's what the previous prototype did as well. He, he for example, if, if it detects HML entities, it just stops the analysis. And that's what current tools on the market do, market do as well. Um, they recognize sanitization. Uh, but still, there's a weakness in this concept because, in my opinion, the concept should look like that. Um, we still have to analyze precisely the markup where our source is uh, getting injected into. That means if you use HML entities on a source that is not always uh, completely secure for all different kinds of markup. We will see some examples later. The same for add slashes. If, if you apply escaping for a SQL query, then that's not, not secure if you don't use quotes, for example, in your user input. And that's the refined concept that the new prototype uh, operates on. So the lessons I learned during the first uh, prototypes um, and the lessons I learned the hard way was that it's quite easy to build a static code analysis tool uh, that detects simple uh, vulnerabilities. Simple vulnerabilities means you have a source, it's assigned to A, A is assigned to B, B is assigned to C, and C uh, steps into a sensitive sync, then that's quite easy to detect. Uh, sophisticated, challenge, uh, sophisticated vulnerabilities, um, such as if the data flow is actually going through some functions, if you have to consider some sanitization, you have to consider the markup, um, and you have lots of thousands of uh, lines of code, uh, then is th that's more, much more challenging, especially if you consider the PHP language, which is quite dynamic and which has a lot of pitfalls you, you have to somehow uh, configure in your tool. And uh, certainly, it's hard to detect those sophisticated vulnerabilities in really large applications, uh, also with an acceptable performance. So you don't want to wait one month until your report is done. Uh, you don't want to uh, use up 20 gigabyte of, of memory, which is probably not acceptable. Uh, and you don't want to get 1,000 reports of false positives you have to go through later on. So that's the hard problem I'm, I'm working on right now. So the new prototype, I hope my slides don't crash again, um, looks a bit similar to the old one. Uh, you can again, I, I'm not going to show all features, the interface doesn't work at all anyway. <laughs> um, so I actually it should jump to the, to the results, but, it, it, but it's not, as you can see. Ah, there you go. So you can see it detected the two SQL injections of the bad bank. You can now, once you see the overview, step through the, um, the issues. Okay, we are a bit limited in space, as you can see. It, it looks a bit nicer <laughs> for larger monitors. Um, yeah, the interface is still a mess, but the analysis results are quite good. Uh, so we detected uh, the file inclusion vulnerability and uh, the two SQL injections, and also uh, the cross-site scripting vulnerability I was talking about that was missed previously. Uh, so here you have this HTML entities uh, function, if you can read it, I hope. Um, and it does not sanitize for this specific HTML markup because the markup is using single quotes and that was detected correctly by our scanner here. Uh, so in, uh, contrarily to the, to the previous version, it does not stop uh, analysis for HTML entities and it triggers a vulnerability report. Okay, let's have a look how the engine works. Let's have a look under, under the hood. Um, so in principle, you can uh, scan source code in a static way or in a dynamic way. Uh, statically means uh, you analyze the source code without executing it. Well, if you analyze it dynamically, then you execute the source code and uh, you would probably, uh, in this case, um, modify the PHP interpreter and while you run the, 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 the program with a specific input set, uh, you would analyze the data flow in the PHP interpreter and trigger some, some events. Um, we chose static code analysis, or I chose static code analysis, uh, because the advantage is that I have full code coverage, so I want to detect all possible bugs that could be in the source code somewhere. The problem is that is 
that I can never be really sure if I can actually reach that code spot. So if you find a weird vulnerability that is somewhere in the administrator area in some plugin, but the plugin has to be activated first, for example, then it might be not a really exploitable issue, but still it's an interesting issue uh, for me. Uh, on the other hand, if you take dynamic code analysis, you, you, um, you don't have the full code coverage, but um, you, are, you, can, uh, you can have much more precise analysis because uh, you're acting with real-time uh, real runtime data, so you actually know really what is happening uh, for this single execution pass. Um, the problem here is imagine if you take just the source code of a PHP application and uh, throw it in your modified PHP interpreter, then it probably would stop first because the database connection is missing and you have to like prepare the environment and um, you have to find somehow inputs for all possible paths in the application. So imagine the vulnerability is hidden in some login at, uh, area, then you would have to log in first and stuff like that. Um, so there are some uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we uh, chose a static code analysis, as I said. The largest problem here is that uh, it is proven that uh, that a program cannot really reason about the logic of another program, uh, to, to generalize it a bit. So we will always have false positives, so reports that are uh, reporting a vulnerability but which are actually wrong. Okay, um, so let's have a look how the engine of the new scanner works. Uh, in an overview, of course, I pass all PHP files or uh, some, some other files um, of, of, a, of a project. Um, then I tokenize the PHP code. We will see uh, what, what I mean by that shortly and build an abstract syntax tree. The abstract syntax tree is then split into basic blocks and we connect the basic blocks to a control flow graph uh, which is our program model then, and then we can analyze this program model for data flow. And um, RIPS uses a, a special technique, a technique called block and function summaries, um, which is yeah, not ge a general concept of static code analysis, but uh, we just added it and I, I will explain it shortly too. So in the bottom of the slides you can see this general concept and we will uh, go into a bit of detail for every single step. So first we want to build an abstract syntax tree. Uh, abstract syntax tree, um, we will see for this example here, we have a, a assignment of a variable and assignments of variables are of course interesting for us because we want to uh, see where is data stored in which variable and then we can resolve another variable that uses this variable uh, back to the initial assignment. So we use a tokenizer and the tokenizer splits the source code into tokens according to the PHP syntax. So we have a dollar sign, you have often numerical characters behind it, that's a variable and so on. And then you can um, pass the semantics of those tokens. So for example, if you have a, a equal operator and um, it's like not surrounded by other equal operators, then you know on the left hand side you have the location where um, the data is stored and on the right hand side you have the data that is actually assigned to the location. So that is displayed then in a tree structure. Uh, so on the left hand side you see the, the location, on the right hand side the expression and the expression can actually be anything again. So it can be another abstract syntax tree. Your, so your abstract syntax trees get quite complex. Um, Okay, now if we have the abstract syntax trees, we can go through all abstract syntax trees and see if we find jump nodes. So in the previous slide we had an assignment node. Um, you can also have jump nodes that occur, for example, if you have an if-else statement or a switch statement. And um, then you uh, split the abstract syntax tree into basic blocks. And a basic block is, is uh, part of the code that has only a single input point and a single output point. And uh, so on the right hand side of the slide you see uh, how that would look like. And what we do then is we summarize each data for each basic block. That's why we split them into basic blocks um, because we can only summarize data that is within one, data, uh, within one basic block. If you would try to summarize data of two basic blocks then 
it could change depending on which path you go, of course. So um, we see here that uh, the variable cookie is assigned from user input and S is using cookie. So we can directly summarize uh, that S is uh, using cookie as well. And the same for the bottom one. Uh, cookie is coming from the default variable, so you can directly assign S to, to default. Um, the important part here is to model really precisely built-in functions. Uh, here I have the trim function, which actually does not do anything except for uh, splitting some white spaces. But um, as you know, the PHP built-in features can be really, really complex, and you have to model them really precisely in order to um, have a precise data flow analysis later on. So uh, once we have our basic blocks, we connect our basic blocks uh, to a control flow graph. So we had an if-else statement. Um, that means um, the control flow can either go through the left part of this graph here or the right part of the graph. The nodes are the basic blocks and the edges are the jump conditions of the if-else um, statement. And once we got this control flow graph, we can uh, perform data flow analysis throughout the basic blocks. And our advantage here is that we don't have to reanalyze every basic block again because we summarized all effects, effects in one basic block already. And now we can go through the block summary where we stored what ha what's happening and resolve data. So for example, if you are um, within this function, a get text, and you want to uh, know what the function could possibly return, uh, then you analyze the return statement. So we do backwards directed data flow analysis. Uh, we have the return statement at the bottom of the graph, uh, which is returning variable s. And now we uh, uh, perform backwards directed data flow analysis and we, we see, okay, s can come from the, from the left uh, basic block where cookie is, uh, is stored in s or from the default uh, variable. And then we recursive, recursively resolve the default variable from previous basic blocks until static content is reached. Uh, in this case, we reach the, the first parameter, the first argument of get text function. So we know that this function will return either the cookie text or uh, the default variable. And because the default variable is the first argument, we can summarize that in the function summary uh, that get text will always return cookie text or its first argument. So that's the intra-procedural analysis. Uh, we perform analysis within the function. And um, whenever we, we find a call to a user-defined function, as in, in line two here, uh, we, we, we trigger the intra-procedural analysis, then we summarize the effects of the function, in this case, get text. And now we have the summary of the function, so for every call of get text, we already know the results, so we don't have to analyze this again. So as with the basic blocks where we sum summarize our analysis results, we also summarize it uh, for the functions. And uh, this allows us to perform really efficient analysis. So in line two here, now we know, okay, get text returns, uh, text can be, uh, to the variable text will be assigned the cookie, uh, or the first argument, in this case, the string foo. Okay, um, the same backwards directed data flow analysis is performed when, when we reach a sensitive sync, such as echo. Um, as I said in the beginning, we always follow the same concept. We have a sync and we try to resolve where the data, the arguments of the sync actually come from. So now we can go backwards uh, directed again over our previous basic blocks and we see S is coming here from cookie or from the default variable, um, and we can, try, we can uh, trigger a vulnerability report uh, in this case. Um, if you remember the concept I refined previously, then uh, we also have to analyze this, the strings. And that is what's called context-sensitive string analysis. The academia has lots of fancy words. Um, so what we are, in the previous slide it was, it was yeah, quite easy, so we just had a sync and a source and we could trigger an, uh, a vulnerability report. 
in this case, we have some markup. In this case, SQL, a SQL query. Um, so we have a, at a, in line eight, we have a, a, a SQL query that gets executed. And we have a look where the where condition that is dynamically built by the script is, uh, is coming from. So we build our program model. Uh, you see the where variable can be defined either in line three or in line six. Then we build our program model. Uh, we have our basic blocks. And uh, now we uh, resolve the where variable uh, from the left basic block and from the right basic block and see that S uh, is actually uh, defined with user input. Now, the important part here is what our scanner uh, does uh, is um, we, we are really precisely uh, simulating the behavior of built-in features. So if you look at the code, we here have sanitization in the, in the first line, uh, namely add slashes, which escapes uh, single quotes and double quotes and also the backslash character. So we are assigning to our uh, symbol that is the first argument of add slashes, here the, the get parameter s. We are assigning to our data some sanitization tags. And we say, OK, this source is sanitized against uh, the SQL markup with single quotes, in this case s, s, sq. And it's sanitized against um, the markup context double quotes. Um, and we store these sanitization tags for this source. Now if we, um, if we resolve the where, uh, if we resolve the where variable, then we get all possible, possibly executed SQL queries. You can see, uh, you see uh, below the, the control flow graph. And then we invoke a markup parser. And since we know it's a SQL executing function, we uh, invoke a SQL parser that will try to figure out for us if we are in what context we are actually within this uh, SQL uh, query. Uh, so for the first SQL query that was taken from the left um, basic block or constructed with the le left basic block, uh, we, we here have single quotes. So because our user input was flagged with uh, a sanitization tag uh, securing, uh, which is secured against single quotes, we do not issue a vulnerability report for that. But for the right basic block, uh, so for the, um, the SQL query at the bottom, there are no single quotes used at all. So the sanitization against single quotes and double quotes, in this case, uh, does not have any effect because the attacker can write SQL, his SQL injection code right away. So the right pass is uh, exploitable, while the left pass would be secure. OK, that's, that was the uh, introduction how, in general, our prototype works. Um, it's a bit more complex than that, but in general, that's, that's the, that is the idea. <coughs> OK, in this part, we are talking a bit about uh, vulnerabilities in modern applications. Um, on the one hand side, I want to show how the prototype is still able to detect vulnerabilities in, in modern applications. And on the other side, you, uh, on the other hand, you can uh, maybe uh, learn about some common developer mistakes. If you not have learned them already from the other HackPro lessons, uh, you can watch out for even during manual an analysis to still detect uh, current bugs in, in, in uh, modern applications. So in principle, the, the data flow, uh, a source flowing into a sink, it remains. Uh, but now the whole uh, cloud of features, uh, the data flow is going through, which you can see on the, on the graphic uh, on the top, uh, it's much more bigger. So there is much more happening. And of course, the more, uh, the, more, uh, the more features we have to simulate and we have to make assumptions about, because on static code analysis, analysis we don't work with real-time data, but only we, do, uh, we can only assume about what's happening. Uh, we will make more and more errors, of course. Um, and yeah, one of those features could be dynamic language features or uh, complex array handling um, or also input sanitization and validation we always, uh, also have seen previously. So if you look at the graphs uh, at the lower image, you can see that actually vulnerabilities 
I don't know if you can read that. It's uh, the CVE database uh, is for um, for um, memorizing all publicly publicly known vulnerabilities, and um, it is it is uh, displayed uh, the CVE submission uh, by year. So you can see in 2006, for example, uh, almost half of all submitted CVE entries that were describing a, a found vulnerability, they were related to PHP, but um, it is decreasing. Um, so in uh, 2013, uh, it is uh, yeah, almost not visible anymore. But that doesn't mean uh, we, we don't have bugs anymore in PHP applications. It just shows that developers get more aware and they uh, apply more sanitization and input validation. So uh, the first thing to look out for, uh, and what the scanner does as well, um, and tries to, to model that really precisely, is to analyze exceptional sources. Exceptional sources means that uh, today, <coughs> Every developer is aware that a get and post parameter or the cookie may contain malicious content, but developers tend to forget about other input sources. So uh, here are four examples, uh, mainly stored in the super global server variable. Uh, so for example, the PHP self server variable is uh, mostly assumed to be st uh, static content. Uh, it should contain the current PHP script that is currently executed. Um, but in the security community, it's actually well known that you can append a slash and further uh, characters uh, to inject um, not only static content, but your whole payload into the uh, PHP self variable. Um, furthermore, the request URI is, is often assumed to be URL encoded, which would sanitize all data. But uh, if you manually craft your HTTP packet or you use the Internet Explorer, then the request UI is not URL encoded and still uh, lets you inject characters to um, exploit vulnerabilities. Um, not so well known is also the HTTP host header. <coughs> so if you craft an HTTP packet uh, and you modify the host header, you would assume that it's not directed to the web server anymore. Uh, but most web server uh, ignore that, and you can uh, and PHP ignores that as well. So you can in the HTTP host header uh, specify actually any characters uh, except slash, for example, and still inject your payload. Um, and that's actually happening for all HTTP underscore uh, headers uh, you can send. So you would craft uh, HTTP packets and define the host. Um, um, with your payload, and it would still get executed. And as a last example, developers um, forget always about file names. I, I see that a lot. So if you upload a file, the developer uh, tends to assume, OK, a file name is usually alphanumerically um, and does not sanitize the, the name. But if you, um, yeah, of course you can uh, put any character you want, except the slash or the null byte, into a file name and upload it, and it will be still a valid file and trigger a vulnerability. Um, so RIPS tries to uh, uh, model these, uh, these um, sources really precisely, and also tries to be context aware again. So for example, a past traversal attack would not work with one of these sources, because you cannot uh, inject a slash into a file name, or you cannot inject a slash in the host header. Or if you start a past reversal attack in the PHP self, uh, against PHP self, you would actually trigger a past reversal attack against the web server. So the scanner tries to be aware of what source works with what vulnerability. Um, important to note also is that uh, the super globals in PHP, um, where we get our user input from, uh, for example, get and post and cookie, uh, they are arrays. So the next step for the scanner was to pr really precisely handle arrays. And we have a lot of vulnerabilities based on, on a complex array handling, uh, which is, uh, which, um, uh, so, so it's really important for the scanner to precisely model the, the built-in functions, for example, that 
um, that split data into arrays and combine them into arrays again or transform arrays. Um, that's what the scanner does. So if you have heard about the Drupal get-on, about the recent Drupal vulnerability, there was a big SQL injection vulnerability in Drupal. I think Drupal is, and, uh, is uh, the third most used software on the internet, uh, on the websites. Um, so there was a SQL injection which allowed, uh, in the end, to take over the, the Drupal installation. And it was based on array keys. So what developers also forget is to uh, sanitize um, array keys. Um, at the bottom of the slide, you, you see a, a color scripting vulnerability, for example, against the recent uh, uh, WordPress uh, version. And here's, here it's the same concept. Um, the developer is looping through uh, the user input array. And uh, if now the key or the value of um, the array is, is used in markup, then we have, we have a, a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So except, I have to use this one. <laughs> um, so you could not only uh, define your uh, cross-site scripting payload in, in each of these um, value pairs, but also in the key which would uh, then trigger cross-site scripting vulnerability if the key would be used in the markup. And developers tend to forget about that as well because keys are usually alphanumeric but can also contain malicious characters. It gets a bit more complex if uh, we try to analyze object-oriented programming code. Um, I try to summarize our concept shortly. Um, but object-oriented code is, is usually, as you can see, it gets uh, gets uh, yeah, it gets a bit more more complex. Um, here is a SQL injection against the recent OS Commerce version, and um, what we have here is we have a file upload. As I mentioned earlier, the file names are tend to to uh, be for forgotten uh, regarding sanitization. And in this line. Shown here, it, a new object is created, a new upload object is created. Um, and then in, this, in the next line, the pass function is called upon this upload object. Now, usually our scanner wouldn't be aware of where to, on what class to call the pass uh, method upon. Uh, because it is divided in basic blocks. Uh, so the line 199 would be one basic block and the upcoming, upcoming lines would be one basic block. And because we analyze basic blocks separately, we wouldn't know what pass method to call because it, there could be more than one different pass method in the source code. And what we do is we propagate um, objects that we, are, that we already analyzed in previous uh, basic blocks, we propagate these, uh, these information forward uh, through our control flow graph. Um, that's what a little uh, arrow on the right hand side, uh, right -hand side uh, tries to uh, emphase. Um, so in line 201, we, we know that the SQL file uh, variable holds an upload object. Then we call the, the pass method. The pass method, uh, in the end, will uh, assign a user input coming from the file name to uh, the file name property. And we update the object information and then propagate our updated object uh, forwards directed. And in the next line, uh, we then know what's in the file name property. And then if we detect a sensitive sync again, we, we perform backwards directed data flow analysis. It's a bit messy, but uh, yeah. So we assist our backwards directed data flow analysis with forwards directed data propagation. Um, yeah, a fourth um, hint for you to detect vulnerabilities or for the scanner uh, to detect vulnerabilities if it's performing uh, correctly is to precisely model, model sanitization. Um, so what we do is for data that we, that we find and model in, in our analysis tool, uh, we keep sanitization tags as I already showed previously. And furthermore, we store an encoding stack, a decoding stack, and an escaping level. So the encoding stack um, is uh, 
keeping track on what encodings were currently performed on the data. So you can have UL encoding, then maybe base64 encoding again, uh, then zlib encoding, and then you zlib decode again, then you base64 decode again. So that's what the stacks are doing. So they try to keep track in what uh, state the data is currently. And the escaping level is simply increased or decreased if data is escaped or unescaped again. Um, interestingly, these four sanitization um, features, they interact with each other. So if you see, if you have a look here at the SQL injection in uh, the recent Plix CMS, um, we have here data that is sanitized by add slashes, but later on it is uh, performed a substring on this sanitized data, which currently, uh, which uh, consequently uh, trims off uh, characters that are longer than 100. So what happens if you uh, inject uh, a long uh, number of characters ended by a single quote, then it will be escaped by the add slashes, but later on uh, if you uh, keep it in the correct length. Later on, characters at the end will be tripped off. That means in the end, there will be um, uh, an unescaped backslash character at the end that can still uh, cause trouble in your SQL query. In this case, if you have a close look at the SQL injection here, there weren't even any quotes around the user input. So the parent variable in line 245 uh, does not have any single quotes, so you could directly uh, inject your SQL payload uh, without even uh, caring about the sanitization. And that is uh, problems we see really often in even recent um, PHP or modern PHP applications. They apply some sanitization, but it's uh, done wrong. Uh, the same thing is that sanitization sometimes is applied for the wrong vulnerability type. So. For example, if you use add slashes here in line 90 in Mambo CMS, um, then escaping quotes does not prevent any injection of uh, HTML markup characters. So you could, uh, oh sorry, you could inject your script text directly into line uh, 91 without even caring that your SQL or double quotes will be escaped. And as a last example, um, we see uh, vulnerabilities that base on um, on user-defined sanitization uh, methods. So they don't use built-in features, but they try to uh, construct regular expressions or string replacements. And in this case, the developer uh, correctly, um, or oh, I, I have to add the, the message variable in line 623 is, is, the, is tainted. And um, the message variable, uh, for the message variable, all double quotes are escaped and also the backslash character, uh, which looks good in the beginning because you cannot break out, out of the JavaScript uh, a function call anymore. Uh, but you could still end the script tag um, and just terminate the current script context and introduce a new script tag. So again, you don't need any double quotes or backslash characters that were correctly escaped, but still there were some missed. Okay. Um, what we did in, in research at the beginning of this year is that we, um, we added detection of second order vulnerabilities. I don't know if you have covered them in the hack part? No. Okay, so we are you learned in the first HackPra lessons about a first order SQL injection. Nobody says that, but I just call them for now first order SQL injection. Um, so you have in line one against user input, and it uh, is uh, flowing into line three into the SQL query, and you have a SQL injection in line four. Now the password is not um, is is. Um, it's not critical because an MD5 sum will be generated from the password and the MD5 sum is only alphanumerical characters. So uh, line two is quite safe while line one uh, causes a vulnerability. Uh, so you send your payload into the application and the application chokes and uh, messes up and uh, a vulnerability is caused. 
Now, what the developers uh, nowadays uh, do is, okay, they escape data, as you can see in line one. So this is correctly escaped data. The quotes cannot be uh, broken anymore um, in the SQL query in line three. And this is a correctly working application. However, here we have an insert SQL query. That means it stores the payload we are submitting into the database. And so our payload was uh, correctly uh, diffused for the first sensitive operation, but our payload is still available in the database. So if later on our payload is read again from the database and used in another sensitive operation, this could cause another vulnerability. Um, so in this case, the name was correctly inserted into the database or securely inserted in the database, but um, if it is printed again to the to the HTML response page, it can still cause a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So what we did uh, to summarize that is uh, we analyzed all writings uh, of, um, or to begin with the left-hand side, we, we analyzed all readings uh, of the application where the application reads data from a database. So we analyzed all SQL queries as long as we could reconstruct them and we um, had a look what columns from which tables were read. Uh, so, and then we created a temporarily vulnerability report. We didn't knew at that moment, is that a vulnerability or not? Uh, but at least it could cause a vulnerability if um, the, the column is taintable. So we, here we have a temporary vulnerability report for the table users and the column name, and it could cause a cross site scripting vulnerability. And during our um, application analysis, we also collected all writings to the database we could uh, determine. So um, if we then see we have a source flowing into a SQL query that is correctly sanitized, but we can uh, arbitrarily write data into the name uh, column of the table users, then we connect those input and output points of the applications, the reads and writes, and um, ask, OK, did you find any writing to, to this uh, table? And was the data written there sanitized already against, um, against the, the, um, the, the vulnerability type we have a temporarily report for? And if not, we create a second order vulnerability report. Uh, in the same manner uh, work multi-step exploits. Um, a multi-step exploit uh, is, or we call them, uh, we make lots of own terminology <laughs> uh, just to make it sound fancy. Um, so what you do in a multi-step exploit is you do have a SQL injection vulnerability, um, but the SQL injection vulnerability allows you to uh, escalate, um, your, uh, escalate your payload uh, further in the, in, into the application. So you have a SQL injection here in, in an insert query. That means if you inject your payload, you can not only taint the name column, but you can also taint the uh, password column. Um, the developer, however, thinks that, OK, the name could be tainted, but the password is always stored by our application uh, with an MD5 hash sum. So it should usually not cause any trouble. But because we exploit a first order vulnerability, uh, we can create another second order vulnerability. Um, namely, when the, pa uh, the password is written from the user's table again and used in a sensitive operation. Uh, so for example, the developer could um, reuse uh, the password hash to create a file name. And usually, that wouldn't cause any trouble because the password hash is alphanumerically. But here, we escalated um, our payload. Uh, OK, so we found a multi-step exploit, uh, for example, against OS commerce. Uh, what you could do here is, first of all, exploit a persistent cross-site scripting vulnerability. So you would inject your JavaScript payload into the database. Um, it is stored there. Later on, if the administrator logs into the admin interface, it would load your JavaScript payload from the database, embed it into the HTML response page, and then trigger your JavaScript payload. And the JavaScript payload would further trigger a SQL injection vulnerability. And uh, 
the SQL injection vulnerability allowed us to, uh, to trigger a multi-step exploit um, because the OS commerce application uses the table structure uh, as you can see at the right hand side um, <coughs> where you could not only change the column value, the third column, but also all upcoming columns. And what the table here stores is some names, some key, uh, some, some name value pairs. Uh, so for example, the, um, the country key and the value 223 is the country ID. And the table also allows you to store a PHP function that is later on called to, um, to map a value to a specific other uh, value. So for example, uh, later on, if you in the administrator uh, interface would list the countries, then the country would be resolved with the get country function, which would probably resolve the 223 ID to some real country name. And because we had a multi-step exploit, we could inject the value ID and uh, tell the, the application, uh, please resolve that with the PHP system function. So a system would be called on ID and we had a remote command execution vulnerability. Another multi-step exploit uh, occurred in the OpenConf um, system. OpenConf is interesting for us researchers because it's a conference management system where you submit your papers to. Um, so uh, what you could do here is you could upload your uh, PDF file. Um, so you could upload only PDF files, uh, namely your paper you want to submit. But also we found um, a pre-authentication SQL injection vulnerability that allowed us as a non-privileged user to execute um, arbitrary SQL code and retrieve information from the database so we could gain administrator privileges. And once we logged in as an administrator, we could uh, reconfigure the application um, to, um, so we could, what we could do is we, we could change the header file. The application is including whenever the application is loaded. And we could point our header file to mm -hmm. our submitted paper. And if our paper con uh, uh, contained PHP code, then this PHP code got executed whenever the application got executed. And again, we had a remote code execution vulnerability. Um, Okay, so as you can see, in the modern applications, sometimes it's a bit more messy to reach your goal, um, but uh, sometimes you can combine smaller vulnerabilities together to, to, um, to an exploit. So the, la the last hint for uh, searching for vulnerabilities in modern applications uh, is to look out for exceptional vulnerability types. So um, you already learned about cross scripting and SQL injection, and uh, more common vulnerability types, but uh, I can encourage you to learn about uh, lots of more different vulnerability types that are not so well known. So, for example, XML entity injection uh, is an interesting one, or PHP object injection um, is, is uh, an interesting vulnerability that, that in the end can lead to remote code execution as well. Um, but they are not so well known, so developers uh, don't like developers could be aware of cross site scripting and SQL injection nowadays, but maybe not uh, be aware of um, exceptional vulnerability types. Okay, and that leads me uh, to the last part of the talk, uh, namely my open challenges. So the tool detects uh, some of these vulnerability types, but other types are hard to detect or just not implemented yet. So, for example, we want to implement the detection of V cryptography, um, which is a bit more difficult because you have to uh, deal with not only a source flowing into a sensitive sink, but with uh, the random number generator, which is used with another function. And you have to detect combinations of uh, several built-in functions. Process request forgery, for example, is hard to detect uh, because you, you don't really know just by scanning the application what is the CSF token and what operation of the application actually needs in CSF token. Um, the same problem with authorization uh, bypasses. Um, you have to figure out first what is authorization in the application. Um, so that is, that is difficult and will 
uh, keep me busy for the next years. Um, also, uh, difficult is to analyze loops with static code analysis. Um, so here we have an example from the MyBB forum. Um, and you here have a, a SQL query builder. Uh, so for example, the data that you, that's actually inserted into the database is uh, first stored in an array. And the array is given to a SQL query builder. And this SQL query builder win, will uh, loop over your array and construct the SQL query. It's a bit of a simplified example. So in the end, the SQL query um, will look like, uh, as shown uh, on the bottom of the slide, and it's really hard to reconstruct these loops, uh, especially if they go over hundreds of, of data and they have some if and else state statements within the loop. It's really hard to resolve that statically. Um, these loops are also often used in frameworks. So frameworks use a lot of query builders. Uh, they do it in a more ugly way, as you can see here on the slide. They have an own builder for a select part, an own builder for the where part, and then they're uh, somehow connected. Uh, they use reflection or they use templates where data is fetched from a file. And since we work with static code analysis, we don't have access to, um, to the file content that is fetched. Um, so that is really uh, difficult and I don't know yet how to solve that. So these, these things uh, lead to false negatives. As a partial solution, what you could do uh, is um, configure your tool framework specific. So you could, for example, take all sensitive things of the send framework, framework or of the hoarder framework and configure them, but then you have to maintain your list and that's a uh, high overhead. And also you would miss vulnerabilities uh, such as the Drupal get-on vulnerability, uh, which was, um, uh, which was uh, which based on uh, their SQL builder. So if you would have already defined a list of the SQL builders of Drupal and then scan the Drupal code, um, you would not find issues anymore that actually rely in the functions you whitelisted. Um, my favorite is parse sensitivity. Um, it's really hard to, to solve as well. So uh, right now we, we have false positives that occur if we have a vulnerability report, but actually the vulnerability cannot be exploited because the combination of parse our scanner assumed and we have full code coverage, so we assume all possible paths. Um, this path is actually an uh, infeasible combination. So for example here, um, it is said if the ID parameter is not numerically, then set the error variable to true. And later on it said, okay, if no error occurred, then echo the, the ID parameter. And our scanner would uh, take the uh, take the sync in line seven, uh, see user input, tries to resolve if the user input maybe was overwritten uh, or in, in, in the condition ex specifically for this basic block was sanitized or validated. Um, but otherwise it would just report this issue and actually it's not a vulnerability. And this gets more complex, for example, if the condition conditions are not um, specified in, in, in the if uh, condition, but some, somewhere in the application and the condition is stored into a variable and the variable flows into another condition. So it gets, uh, it gets problematic. Um, there are some, <coughs> some solutions for that. Uh, it's a whole academic field that try to solve this problem um, and they use uh, satisfiability solvers. Um, for example, set three is a really uh, uh, known one, um, but it, it gets into performance problems. If you then, for each condition, try to uh, s try to use a satisfiability solver that tr uh, tries to figure out if combinations are possible, then uh, we get into performance problems. And then the question arises: Would you rather have false positives than a more longer scan time? And yeah, but that is uh, for the future. Um, I think that's, that's it. <laughs>